One in four Americans today, hard statistic, are on antidepressants. One in four. School shootings. The dissolving of gender boundaries. The dissolving of social economic classes. All these other things that are happening, right? If everybody just stopped right now, right fucking now, just stop what you're doing and reach up into the invisible space, the fourth dimension, and began to stand and pull those things that you keep hidden down and speak your truth, the conditions of your life would change immediately. And what we need as a society is we need the truth. And the truth sets us free. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 10 years on active duty as a SEAL with uh, SDV Team 1, which we're going to get into, uh, four years as a CIA contractor, and he's the CEO and founder of Heroes and Horses. Who also uh, coincidentally has the nickname, not the nickname, the uh, the last name that translates as one who is disapproved of or held in contempt in. Did you know that? No, but it's uh, I I welcome the name yeah. and I'm thankful for it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Micah Fink. It's also uh, how they say think in Eng- in England, right? It's like, yeah. what do you think? I always feel like I get all this mail and it's like always says Micah Sink. Oh yeah. Yeah, which I. Um, I've kind of just adopted that. I don't try to change it anymore. I haven't yeah. cracked my name. I'm just kind of like, <laughs> okay with being called whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking classic. What, uh, what's the favorite thing in your life? Um, <clears throat> you know, I feel like kind of at this point in my life, uh, I'm really been uh, going through what I call the great unlearning, uh, you know, really with my work, with the foundation, uh, Heroes and Horses, uh, it's really become this great unlearning uh, where um, kind of uh, the dissolving of all the way that I've ultimately like looked at life and seen life through my own identity and experiences. And so it excites me. And then really learning um, that ultimately, um, you know, there's something that we can do uh, as a generation if we are willing to take that step and look at ourselves for who we really are, that uh, we can create real change. And so that's what I'm really excited about. Of course, before that comes my family and, you know, my five kids uh, and, and the life that we live and what the ecosystem that we're building. So that's that's what excites me the most. Are they uh, a, a, a disparate age range? Like, is there a... Yeah, they're, uh, my youngest is eight months. Uh, Solara, I just we just actually uh, delivered her uh, outside under the stars on the ranch. No shit. Uh, my wife, I, and a midwife, and all the kids were there. Observed it. Um, it was crazy. It was like raining. I was trying to hold this umbrella up. I had candles going and shit. Um, but uh, and my oldest is sixteen, so oh. one boy and four girls. Man, uh, is the boy the oldest? No, he's uh, he's nine. Oh, okay. Motocross guy, rides horses, jujitsu. Yeah. Broken leg right now. <laughs> Which is the telltale sign of a good childhood if they've got a broken leg at some point. <laughs> or that, that they're still fucking doing something. Exactly. What uh, What's the last full book that you've read? Um, I'm uh, actually just finishing a series of books um, right now. I just finished um, uh, The Kabayan uh, by the Three Initiates. Um, and so that's the last full book that I just finished. Um, and on this trip, uh, reading another uh, kind of a book about archaeology uh, called The Lost Teachings of Atlantis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite childhood memory? Oh, man. You know, I had a wild childhood. Um, Is there one thing that stands out? Uh, yeah, let me think about it. Uh, so, you know, I grew up in the, uh, I always say that uh, at the time I had become basically saved uh, more times than any person in recorded history because my dad, uh, you know, after, um, you know, my dad you know, went to prison and was a pretty rough dude, uh, became a revival preacher. 
And so they got like a tent in the eighties. And, uh, I remember being like a little kid having to send the tent up all the time. And there was like a blinking light. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if it's my favorite memory. Maybe that's my scariest memory. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of every single weekend, I pretty much had gotten saved like nine times because they would bring you over the fire <laughs> and they'd hold you there. You know, you're like six or seven years old. Yeah. They're like the worms and the demons and the things. Um, but actually growing up as a kid in upstate New York in a rural community, uh, and uh, living really the wild life of a child. I think all of those things combined are my favorite memories. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does, uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. You know, it's uh, it's kind of depre- not kind of depressing. It's massively depressing to see the disparity between growing up in the '70s and '80s, even the '90s, versus the way kids are growing up now. Like it's uh, it's fucking sad. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's dark. Yeah. What uh, your morning routine is as far as uh, on a day when you're at home and you know it's just kind of a normal day, if that even fucking exists. What does your morning routine look like from the time you get up, say, for just the first few hours? Yeah, so I live in a really rural area. Um, like I said, I have five kids, so my whole entire house is heated by wood. You know, I live in rural Montana. We got to negative 60 this year where I lived. Uh, what, what part? I live in Cardwell, so I live about 45 minutes outside of Bozeman. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. And I, uh, um, so I'll get up in the morning usually like 4.30, stoke the wood stoves, uh, do some reading with my wife who gets up. Uh, and then I'll spend, uh, uh, probably about like a half hour in just, uh, quiet meditation. Um, and then, uh, work out cold shower and then morning circle with my children. Uh, and then I get on with my day. What does the morning circle consist of? Um, it's kind of like, uh, setting an intention for the day. Um, you know, I think that, um, really like what happens is, is that we spend so much of our life living in the future. And, you know, people don't realize that the future is only a concept. It, it, it doesn't exist. Um, you know, it's created by who we are in the present moment. And the present moment is created by the past. And so what happens is, you know, we create this predictable future, which we think by kind of recreating experiences from the past, but it becomes predictable future. We never like the outcomes. And so I always use the example like, we have to be in the moment in the now. And so many people will say that and, you know, they don't really understand what that actually means. But the thoughts that you're having are creating conditions that then you later on experience, whether you know it or it's unwittingly happening. And so it's important to teach my children like how to use their mind without their mind taking over and how to use their mind to create different conditions and being able to hold those conditions uh, regardless of what's happening on the outside and kind of external circumstances. So. Um, yeah, every single morning starts with a morning circle. And so we do some like kind of do some breath and we do some focus and we set an intention and then each child will share something, uh, you know, for that they've learned from the day or whatever. And then they've got chores, you know, at, by, by seven o'clock in the morning, they've already been outside working for 45 minutes before and we homeschool the kids. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's fucking awesome. It, could you provide, uh, like an example of an intention that you would, uh, set? Yeah. So like, um, for instance, like, uh, take like judgment. Uh, so all judgment is self judgment, right? This is why we live in such a critical world because we think that so many people are judging us or looking at us or perceiving us in a certain way, because that's actually how we're perceiving ourselves. And so we assume that that's what people are thinking about us and we outsource our joy and our happiness and our kind of equilibrium as people to other folks minds, which may or may not be happening. So <clears throat> for instance, like the intention of the day could be like, like, I'm not going to judge anything. Okay. So that really starts with you. 
Um, and intention for the day would be like balance. Okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna overeat. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take too much. Right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, sit in front of the screen for 10 hours or I'm not gonna, you know, whatever that is. So things like balance, uh, things like harmony, things like uh, strength or courage, you know, what's lacking in society today is actually courage. It doesn't take courage to post something online. Um, you know, so many people think, uh, they outsource all the power because somebody may have 60 million followers or they have this or they have that and they outsource power because you have money. And I always tell people, I'm like, money doesn't make people powerful. That's not why you should follow them. Money only gives you access to authority. And the more money you have, the more access to violent authority you have, but you don't have power. Real power is like, I don't know, take the leader of the free world, Joe Biden, put him in this room. Is he powerful? No, he's a geriatric, decrepit old person, right? That's never even lifted up a shovel. And you just walk over and just blow on him and he falls over. But then we relinquish all our power under the illusion that they have something that we don't have. And we get tricked into a form of servitude. And then we build the systems that put us in deeper prisons uh, that are managed by our own minds. What uh, do you get that deep in in with your kids? Like, do you have those types of conversations? Yes. Yeah. I, I've sat down. I sat down with my son like recently on the hill. My son, you know, he got a chainsaw for Christmas. He's a very hardy young man. He splits wood, and I mean, he's responsible for all the wood stoves at the house and uh, feeding the feeding of the livestock. Drives a tractor. And he's nine. Yep. Yeah. And um, he's a young man. He's running the household right now and uh, he cooks and does all the things. And, you know, I sat down on the hill with him and I, uh, we, we went up on the hill uh, recently. It was snowing out. We sat up there and, and I tell my kids how the world really is. Not in my idea, not in my perception. I tell them how it really is because the truth is, is that, you know, America is the new reservation, unfortunately. Um, and it's become that way. And we were being we're being tricked into killing ourselves with our own mind. We're being tricked into destroying our own society with our own thoughts. And my children are not going to participate in that system um, because it is a system. And uh, we have to begin to live in a different way, which means we have to have courage to change to stand. Because, you know, my question is like my son looks at me as a former soldier or whatever and and everybody will say that's a warrior and what i've come to realize is that we made a transition as a society from being warriors to being killers and historically warriors um fought for all life and for the earth that's what that our mother you know people can say oh you're like a hippie or whatever well then come on over here to this room and then I'll show you something different. Um, you know, uh, this is our mother, right? We drink from her breasts, right? She grows our food. We get life. We live from her, right? But we're abusive and warriors fought for, for, the, for the life giving force of the planet. And they fought for, uh, they fought for freedom and they fought for, uh, justice right but now um we've kind of traded this to be killers and um and and i'm training you know my my children and my son to be a warrior and a warrior doesn't follow orders he follows his own heart and uh never before in society have we had a time where the strong men have gone off to wars directed by the weak men who have never spilt blood men who have never been in battle, people who have never been in fights. And, um, and I will not going to teach my, you know, children to do that. They're going to fight for the things that actually, uh, are necessary to go and potentially even lose your life for. Um, and that's what a warrior is. And, it, and, you know, it's, uh, it's not the clothes you wear or even the titles that you've had. It's, you know, it's what you stand for. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is, is that we need warriors right now. We need warriors, right? We don't need more 
stuff. We don't need more things, you know? It's like, it's like Monopoly. Houses and cars, utilities, you know? You screw over granny, you fuck over your sister, you take all their stuff, everyone's crying, and you win. Game is acquisition. But at the end of the game, what happens? It all goes back in the box. And what are we handing over to the next generation? They get the box, they take it all out. They try to get as many cars as they can, collect as many things as we can. And right now, this is to me the age of the warrior. We need warriors and I look and I look and I look and my work with the veterans and all the things like, just because you're a veteran doesn't mean you're a warrior. It's a different thing. And so um, that's kind of like what I'm really focusing on with my children because I realize that my impact on the world will happen from my willingness to do work in my own heart and then through my children and then into the world. That's the, that's the legacy that we need as a, as, as a unified species, humans. And I think we're missing it. I think we need to sit and talk with the kids. We don't need to... We don't need to like, you know, shield them from all of the things. We need to speak truth to them because you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free from yourself. Do you, uh, do they ever ask you about your time uh, in the military and on the transverse? Do you ever struggle with, um, not necessarily things that you've done, but like on a, on a principled level, you know, I mean, everything that you just said, I, I don't disagree with it. Um, and, and similarly, like having spent 12 years in the military and been overseas and fought wars for those same types of people. When I think about the age I was when I was doing what I was doing, how I feel about it now, there's a pretty big fucking contrast. Um, <laughs> do you struggle with that at all? Do you, how do you reconcile what you've done and how you feel about it now? Do, do you think about that a lot? Do you explain it to them? Well, when obviously when it was going on, I was basically a caveman. I mean, to be completely honest with you, I didn't really even care who I was fighting. I'd basically come up fighting my whole life. It's like, like full Viking. Full Viking. I mean, I came up fighting. I came up from, you know, even though my dad, you know, I'd become a, pa I came from a lineage of really tough guys. And I don't like, mean you know, that like, I just did. My grandfather was in prison for 10 years. Like these were tough people, blue collar, alcoholics, violence, all the things that's been changed. Um, but it was in my blood. So I was boxing, fighting, fist fight. I mean, you just name it. I've been fighting my whole life. And so when I was at the World Trade Centers on 9-11, my natural propensity was to like want to go and like hurt other people over it. And that was it. And it was like, I didn't really care who it was. I mean, if I was to be completely honest, the only thing I wanted to do was do it. That was my biggest gripe in the military was like, I pretty much just wanted to be on deployment all the time and never come back, which is not realistic. You know, you got to go to training and all the things, but like, I mean, because I was just there to fight. I just wanted to fight. And it, now when I look back, you're absolutely right. My perspective has changed. People say perception is reality. But when people say that they're wrong because reality is reality and perception is the lens in which you're seeing reality through. And so as time went on, um, you know, all of the things like not to go on the war story thing, but like, especially when you get over into kind of like, you know, the, the CIA contractor world and all those kind of things, your perspective begins to really shift. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always use this example right now, somewhere there's an airplane of uh, young American troops uh, and they're at church right now. And everybody in, let's say Georgia's, um, praying for them and bring them home safe and, you know, kill the enemy and defend us and bring us home. And, you know, all these, you know, defending the nation and all the things, right. Kill the bad guys and everyone in the church is cheering them on. And so Johnny and all his guys, they board on the helicopter and everyone's waving the flags and they get on the airplane and they fly 5,000 miles away from our coast. And then over 5,000 miles away, Muhammad or whoever wakes up in the morning and he's facing East and praying five times a day seven kids, wife, farmer, small ranch, goes to the mosque, prayer to call happens. They do the prayer, family comes around, they pray, please bring our dad home safe. They pray to God, you know, their God, whatever, uh, to protect them from the invaders. And so that airplane lands, 
and this other individual heads out into the battlefield. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, who's right? Who's right? See, it's I kill, you kill, I kill, you kill, I kill. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So like, would they be a terrorist if I wasn't there? Well, you killed my neighbor. I've never hurt a person in my life, but now I want to get them back because I'm taking care of their family. I'm angry, right? Oh, now we have another terrorist. He doesn't, they don't like us, right? This is indicative of the whole world right now. And so, you know, there's an apocalypse happening. I use the word apocalypse and people, they kind of get like rattled up and they think this kind of like an esoteric kind of thing of an apocalypse. Well, what's an apocalypse? It's the death of systems. It's a dissolution of, of gender, of race, economics, complex political systems, environmental processes. They're falling apart. And our answer is to kill our way out of it. It's not going to work because what's going to happen is it's a two-headed snake. And that's what we're beginning to feel in North America. You ride through, you go to Philadelphia right now, Apocalypse. Why? There's tens of thousands of people dying in the streets, covered in sores. Right? You go to Baltimore, it's an apocalypse. 150,000 veterans have killed themselves since 2005 in a war where 7,000 died. What about their kids? What happens to them? It's an apocalypse. It is an apocalypse. So, like, America is there, but what's happening is because we live on a postage stamp, we think it's not happening. And so we wait some, for some arbitrary event to come out of nowhere. Like, that's when I'll know it's here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's fucking here. It's here. It's in the borders. It's in our nation. It's in the streets. Look at the fentanyl deaths. Look at the education. Kids graduating sixth grade reading levels in North America. Okay. What does this pencil out into? Warriors. We need warriors. We don't need businessmen. We need people that are willing to stand up and to get together and be like, what are we passing off to the generation? Change of command. Imagine if the military was like, we run the world. Oh, change of command. And they change the command, they give it to the next commander and he walks in there and everyone's like shooting fentanyl, shitting in the corners or wearing like wigs and they're like fighting with each other and everyone's on social media like hanging out like, here you go, buddy. How's that going to work out? So I think that this is the time where the revolution, you know, people talk about revolution and everyone gets like, oh no, revolution. They think civil war, like shooting each other out and, you know, I don't know. The revolution is a thought revolution. We have to begin to think differently. It's not a violent revolution. Violence is not going to work. Maybe it could spill into that one day. Who knows? But what I'm saying is like a thought revolution. And, and that's ultimately like what I've been focusing my life on because what I've done in the military, what I did or whatever, there's guys that have done light years more than I've ever done. But what I've learned is that like we can't kill our way out of these problems. And we have to create, you know, our thoughts create conditions and we have to create new conditions by how we think because everything in our life is a thought first. And we have to begin to take ownership of our own minds and then act different. So is everything that you just said uh, something that you would discuss with your kids? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. I sat down with my son. Like I sat down with my son and I said, son, I'm going to tell you how the world is. Yeah. What, uh, what is his response to that? Like how, how does he uh, react when you, tell, when you tell him that? He wakes up every morning, runs two miles alone down a ranch where, road in freezing cold weather. Um, he reads. He prepares himself. Taught him how to fight, how to have a hard body. Doesn't eat junk food. Doesn't watch TV. My kids don't have iPads. You my 17 year old daughter. I have a TV. Yeah. My uh, there's a reason why it's called television. Most people don't know that. It's called tell a vision. And it channels and programs information to you. And then you act it out because you don't have control of your mind. You know, if people realize that every single thing on this plane, the third dimensional plane is a thought first. 
So if everybody starts thinking things are bad, things are bad, things are bad, what happens? Things are bad. You go to a doctor, they got a white coat on. Yeah, you never seen this, you know, person before in your life. They sit down, they're like, oh, trouble sleeping. You're like, yeah, yeah a little bit. Oh, you got some of this. Oh, yeah, a little bit. You got PTSD. You're like, what? Like, you have PTSD. You're like, I do? Really? I've never heard of that. You have PTSD. I do? You leave. Guess what you got? PTSD. Thanks for the gift. Every person in the world has PTSD. Life is supposed to be difficult or there would be nothing to learn. There's nothing to learn. If you came here and nothing happened, utopia, you would never know what you are. You would never know what you are. You would be standing there like there would be nothing to see. So it's like, I sat down with my son and my daughters and my 17 year old daughter. She doesn't have a cell phone either. She has a flip phone by her own choice because they're living in a different way. Now people might say like, you know, that's extreme. I'm like, okay, well, how extreme does it got to get where you kind of realize like what we're doing right now? Human beings are at the end of the genetic developmental processes of ourselves because we've merged with electronic prostheses that control every aspect of our life so it's like a it's like a human machine symbiosis merger and so we sit there and order food in our house 300 pounds 44 percent of americans are dying of obesity 690 million people globally are starving and we're sitting there and we're coming to the end of our genetic developmental processes because now machines are taking over I'm not talking about like ChatGPT telling you like it wants to kill people or whatever. Bring it on, ChatGPT. I, I dare you. I'd, like, I'd just be like, just won't make any more oil. Oh, you broke down. <clears throat> but, you know, we have to, uh, you know, so we have, because we're not thinking our own thoughts. Thoughts create conditions and we are thinking the thoughts that we are essentially slave. We are, we are in slavery as thought generating manifestors. That's what it is. So you, as a Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This is bad. So it is. I look at the mountain. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Wow. Somebody else looks at the mountain and says, man, if I go up there, there's like grizzly bears. And what if I die in an avalanche? So it is. Same mountain. What's changed? So like the, everybody collectively is thinking these, they don't realize that they're living and creating their own experiences. They're literally creating the experiences so that they can move through them to set themselves free from the prison they've created for their own self. Do you, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is there something? Else? No, I mean, like, whatever. I don't know. I'm like off the deep end, like pretty much of the first yeah. 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, uh, I mean, to me, it's, it, it builds a lot of uh, backdrop and context to how, a how you live your life now and b uh, and most importantly i think you know the the output that you have in the veteran community with the program that you're running and, and changing mm -hmm. guys lives and how important that is so i, I you know I, I think it's important to hear your perspective on all that stuff um are, are talks like that things that you prescribe to um, you know the students that come through your course do you do you uh, you know, have, have discussions like that with them, I assume. Yeah. So the program, uh, essentially people, you know, uh, people hit me up all the time. They're like, you know, they want to create a program just like it or this and that. And they are always like surprised by my answer, which is like, I'll tell you everything I know because I don't want anything. <laughs> I don't even care if you say you got it from me. I don't care. I'm, I'm thinking like, what am I handing off to the, to the next generation? That's what I'm thinking all the time. It's not about me. The world needs less me and more we. Well, okay. So I, so essentially I created the organization to heal myself from my own wounds. Looking back, that's what it was. What I needed didn't exist and I created it. I just so happened to be the type of person that was able to take other people along with me. Um, and so today the program is 41 days long. So to get to a person where they're going to be able to be receptive to the reality of what is, right? So like there's a gap between what you suppose things should be and what really is, 
right? The reality on the ground, they'd say in the military, or what you suppose it should be. Well, the gap in between that creates anxiety, fear, worry, all these things come from that gap, what you suppose it should be or want it to be and what it really is. So to get to where people are receptive, you have to, they have to essentially embark on the hero's journey. So they have to dissolve all these kind of aspects um, that create these kind of anchors in their life, which prevent them from personal growth. So it's 41 days of no hot showers, 41 days of cold plunges, 41 days of sauna, 41 days of breath work and meditation, five to 600 miles on their horses. Every day starts at 4.30 in the morning. There's only meat and vegetables, water and black coffee. There's nothing else. There's no cell phones. So the first two weeks, it's digital detox. Um, they live in a tent, sleep on the ground. They build fires. They chop wood. They walk 80, 90 miles to meals. They'll spend 17 days in the wilderness. And they'll go through two Lakota uh, purification ceremonies in, in an Anipi Wakan, which is a sweat lodge. Um, and uh, they'll go through those things. And then there's a 41-day course like you could say it's a philosophy course we call it the maxim lab i'm completely opposed about putting information into people i do not believe it works i think that you have to awaken the wisdom which is inside of each one of us that's what has to happen you know we are constantly getting shit shoved into our heads and you know we think somebody's smart because they know a bunch of they've memorized a bunch of information right oh you go and you get a four-year degree and you're like, oh, that person has a four-year degree. I don't. They must know more than me. No. They've gotten a business license to work in that capacity. That's it. That's all it is. It's an authorization to work with a liberal arts degree, right? Now go to a call center and make 40 grand a year so you can pay off your $150,000 loan. Slavery, right? Go to your office, prison, do what you're told. And by the way, don't say anything mean about anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yay. Freedom. I'm so free. So, um, but to get people to a place where they're ready to realize that they're the one they've been looking for, right? There's not some kind of like Calvary coming. It's us. It's you. It's me, right? It's a people listening. You're the one you're looking for. This outside idea that like some kind of you know, self-proclaimed like superhero is going to come like save us and the red team or the blue team is going to win and they're going to save us. Well, if you look at the eagle, it's one head with two wings, wings of the same bird, right? So we're the ones. Well, the individual shows up and they're constant, the American veteran, the state of the American veteran is in a total apocalypse. I don't care what you see on Instagram. I don't care, you know, guys that are selling you whatever, like they got businesses. I'm telling you right now, it is a disaster. It, it is a disaster. I've been doing this for nine years. I've read thousands and thousands of applications. Okay. You are not doing good if you're taking 10 psych meds a day and you don't work you're obese, you live in a trailer, and you're sitting there, you know, waiting for your subscription to come to the mailbox and standing around for a paycheck because you were a Marine in 2006. You are not doing good. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales 
to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bubbs' honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. All right, guys, as you know, I'm into uh, health and fitness uh, and specifically how nutrition relates to it. Um, coffee is a, has been a staple of mine and, and I think most people's for a long time. Um, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Mudwater, which is a sponsor of this show. They have been uh, for a while now and, and we have a great partnership I love their product. Um, it's a phenomenal alternative to coffee. Uh, for me, you know, coffee, there's jitters, there's mold in it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it tends to, to kind of upset my stomach. Uh, but Mudwater has adaptogenic uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a fraction of the caffeine that coffee has. There's a little bit, but it's very, very little. Um, and it, it really leans on, on mushrooms and the blend of matcha and chai for kind of that sustained energy that, that continues to go and, and doesn't crash the way coffee does when, uh, when it runs out. Uh, they use lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to support physical performance, chaga and raishi to support the immune system, turmeric for soreness, and cinnamon for antioxidants. Um, I, I really enjoy that first cup of warm liquid in the morning by taking mud water instead of coffee, and I'll put uh, just a splash of, of heavy cream uh, or even some protein powder, uh, some collagen powder. Um, and I also throw, uh, usually a couple drops of, uh, stevia or, uh, monk fruit vanilla to make it kind of a, a thick normal morning coffee ritual type of, uh, concoction. And, uh, I gotta tell you, it, it, it does wonders for me. And, and I'm really, really glad that I switched. It's been, you know, better part of a year now, uh, you know, that I've been taking that uh, and using that as part of my uh, daily morning routine. And it's fantastic. I love it. I, I can't re recommend it enough. Uh, it's hundred percent USDA, uh, organic, non GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and they also donate to the Berkeley center for science of psychedelics, which is, uh, you know, groundbreaking and leading research to help veterans with PTSD, uh, and other, uh, associated illnesses and, and, uh, syndrome. So, uh, great cause, great company, phenomenal product. If you go to Mudwater, that's M U D W T R dot com forward slash Mike to su support this show and the product, uh, and use the code Mike Mud, M I K E M U D all caps for fifteen percent off. That's again Mudwater M U D W T R dot com forward slash Mike, and the code is Mike Mud M I K E M U D all caps for fifteen percent off. Go check them out. Do you know uh, even ballpark what the percentage of veterans are that, that kind of fall into that apocalypse category? Um, my estimation would be, um, and remember, there's really, there's, uh, there's three kinds of lies, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so <laughs> shout out to my buddy, Jay Lapp, who always says that. He's an amazing guy, 20-year Marine, amazing guy. Um, but that's the truth. But so uh, my estimation is close to probably around 70%. Um, 
because uh, if you look at the institutions, and I can take the internal statistics from all the people that have ever applied. I had a guy who um, last year was on 32 pills. I had another guy that was on 17 pills a day. And another guy that was on 13 last year. In fact, like... Is that, is that a mixture of like pain meds, psych psychiatric meds, fucking... Mm -hmm. Most of them are like, so, so, you know, because people will tell you, oh, a lot of guys will say, hey, I got this for a headache, right? And you look at it and it's not for headaches. Um, but no, a lot of them are psychotropic, psychiatric type medications. Now, one of the first things you do when you get accepted into the program is you enter into the communication strategy. So our communication strategy, basically the day, the, the application itself is like, it's very difficult to fill out. Some guys said, take some weeks. Um, it's probably like 50 questions, I think. Um, they're very in depth. And an interesting thing we send out to the guys is that you're not gonna, you're not gonna, this isn't gonna work if you don't get off this shit, period. Is that a requirement that they don't take? So on? what we do is I'm not about putting information into people and telling them what I think you should do. You have to have your own thoughts. You're your own person. You have your own perceptions, other things. You have to undo you, I'm undoing me. Well. We send out like a new video, a great video just came out. I'm trying to, I think his name is Dr. Newton, um, peer reviewed Harvard PhD and chemist uh, and PhD in psychiatry. You know, there's been a 30 year study that was conducted on the use of SSRIs, serotonin uptake inhibitors, antidepressants, anti anxieties, anti psychotropics. The whole idea of Zoloft, the first drug to ever come out, was never ever proven it was a hypothesis written in 1967 that was taken by the pharmaceutical companies and they made a commercial and the commercial had a little gray blob that's bouncing down the road it's powerful marketing the blob is like the saddest little fat little blob with no arms and legs and he's just like totally bummed and he's just like boing 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 and then a little bluebird comes along <laughs> comes along and he sees a little blob and he lands on him that's Zoloft. One in four Americans today, hard statistic, are on antidepressants. Okay. One in four. School shootings, the dissolving of, of, of gender boundaries, right? The dissolving of social economic classes, anxiety, all these other things that are happening, right? One in four. All right. Well, he's like, it's never been observed that that's what it even does. So they've studied it for 30 years. What it does do is make you suicidal and depressed. Do you know the, the chemistry behind that? Like, not, I mean, not to get too far in the Well, the idea here, was that serotonin, the more serotonin that you have is that you're happy that happier that you are. Right. And like, uh, you know, there's like, uh, so, you know, they believe that uh, there's chemical processes that block you from that and blah, blah, blah. But what it is, it's the perception. They've done, if you will get a chance to go on after school and look and look up the uh, uh, anti-depression myth video with this doctor, you'll get really heavily into the chemistry. And the, we send out this type of information and there's um, tons of information on this stuff. And we let the person decide. But the truth is, if you're applying to come to this program, what you're doing in your life is not working. Yep. It's failing. And the truth is, every 64 minutes, a veteran kills himself in North America. This morning, a veteran killed himself. A friend of mine reached out before this podcast. Last week, another guy in one year lost the eighth guy out of his unit to suicide. Okay? The dead are dead, and they can't be undone. The past can never and never will ever, ever, never be altered, ever. So that's over. We, have, we don't have to like it, but we have to accept it. Okay. But what about the living dead? The warriors? These are the ones that can rise up and we can live in a different way. The power of the good mind. Einstein was asked the question, ideas and opinions. He said, um, he said, what is the most important natural law? And he said, the law of compounding. I'm like, what's the law of compounding? You start thinking about that. Start reading about it. What's happening right now is what he was saying is society has entered into a reverse explosion. It's an explosion in reverse. So an implosion. An implosion. 
That's what we're experiencing right now, an implosion. And if you are blocking your consciousness, you, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get there. Yeah. Uh, so from, uh, I guess from a protocol standpoint, do you guys have hard, hard lines in place where like, Hey, if, if you're accepted to this, you can't bring medication. You can't be on that shit while you're here. Or, or is it, you, I mean, listen, I wish I could do that, but I probably get sued and someone, you know, which would didn't care. Cause I wouldn't answer the letters because I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you got to speak the truth that the truth is, listen, you'll be put in jail today for your ideas. I understand that. So it's like, they'll put you in and they will put you in jail for your own ideas. All right. Just ideas. You don't have to do anything. Ideas. So um, what happens is, is we, we really do an amazing job, I believe, leading up to it, where the majority of guys work with their care providers, even though they push back on them because they're drug dealers. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys say, hey, man, I don't, uh, don't use any street drugs. And then they'll be on 18 pills. And you're like, What's the difference? You should start smoking weed and get off all that <laughs> stuff. Like, I mean, if come on, dude, do yeah. the street drugs. By the way, yeah. it like grows over there next to a palm yeah. tree, <laughs> under, under that pile of cow shit. Yeah, stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, that's wild. Um, I, I definitely want to get more into uh, your program, but I would like to cover a little bit of your your backstory uh, in the interim. You're from upstate New York, yeah. uh, grew up in in kind of a rough scenario. Can you kind of uh, synopsize what your childhood was like? Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I have an amazing mom and dad um, who, you know, my dad was a real hard ass. He was an amazing guy, uh, still is a great guy, but he's a real hard ass. He had a tough life. He grew up uh, seven brothers and sisters. Um, grandfather was a mob guy, and, uh, you know, he went did hard time in prison, real hard time. Like Italian mob? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> so he did 10 years. Nobody knows why he never talked. And then he got out and became the head of the conductors union for the railroad when he got <laughs> out, uh, never went to school. He was an orphan. Um, oh. and so, uh, amazing guy taught himself how to like read and write and all the things, uh, do math and all He's a smart guy. And, um, yeah, my father, uh, obviously grew up in that and went to, uh, you know, got drafted into Vietnam uh, because he was facing some, some tough things and had kind of had a choice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my dad, uh, you know, in the late seventies, uh, after kind of getting out of, uh, getting out of prison, you know, he uh, became a Christian. And B before you go <laughs> past that, um, he, he uh, volunteered or was drafted, you said drafted? Well. It was a go to prison or go yeah to yeah. What, uh, what branch did he go into? I uh, was eighty second airborne. Oh shit! Um, did did he talk about his experiences in Vietnam much, or was he? He didn't go. Oh okay. He went to prison. Oh no shit! So instead of going, mm -hmm. or, he or, made it through jump, did all the things, and did all the stuff, and then wound up. Uh, um, you know, he was tied up in the big biker. Uh, it was heavy times yeah. back then, and so he was. Uh, you know, my dad, it's interesting because his, uh, you know, hearing the stories about growing up, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, we grew up, uh, people would be like, couldn't believe that my dad had become like a pastor, right? Um, because to say that my dad back then in those days was violent is an understatement, okay? And I'm a real tooth in his head. They've all been knocked out with hammers. He's got 190 stitches across the top of his head, okay? Like, you know, rough, rough, rough. And, but actually what it was, it was like really like, he needed, he needed direction and guidance for those. And those are powerful gifts, right? But they're just misdirected. And so, um, yeah, so he, yeah, was a jump guy and got certified and all the things. And then, uh, you know, when he got out, he was, he was pretty lost and ended up, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to marginalize his experience and say like he saw the light or whatever, but you know, he became, became a Christian. What did he go to prison for? Uh, uh, I think he was moving, um, uh, drugs with uh, military or something. <laughs> What's the fucking movie? What's the uh, movie with Denzel Washington? I think where they're bringing heroin from. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I look at my dad. And I'm like, I, I wouldn't. My dad is like such a great mentor to me. Though I didn't always see eye to eye. I left home really young. I left home, you know, basically 15, and then by 16, I was gone and I've been on my own ever since. Um, it, those were hard times, you know, and for me and, and he was still kind of figuring out his own life, even though, you know, you had all the, the Christianity and stuff, but I wouldn't change one thing. He's been a great mentor to me. And you know what? My dad's always, he's a stand up dude. He is a stand 
up guy. And there's not a lot of those men left. So one thing I did learn like from a very young age um, was to stand up. Didn't matter about being popular. It was never about that. You stood up. It didn't matter if there was 50 people. It didn't matter. You stood up. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the greatest lessons I ever learned from him. That's a powerful lesson, no doubt about it. And I couldn't agree more. Like to say that they don't make them like they used to uh, <laughs> is an understatement too. I mean, it's a, it's beyond a dying breed. They're they're bordering on extinct. Do you remember him being in prison? Like, was he in prison when you were a young kid or a, a teenager, or, or what was? No, the so I was born in seventy nine. So he, I think, he got out in like seventy six. Okay. Um, and so you know, right before my sister was born, and, and uh, so I don't remember that. But like you know, you kind of carry that. You know, my dad was, uh, you know, my dad was in solitary confinement. I mean, he was uh, he was a rough dude. Yeah. And uh, you know that has an impact on you. You don't just like snap back from that. Yeah. Um, but he did. He's a resilient guy, and he became uh, uh, an engineer in the railroad and uh, started driving trains. Uh, and then I think in 1983 is when he like left that railroad, or 1985 is when he left the railroad and started uh, becoming a pastor. Yeah. So the the majority of your childhood, you knew him as a, as a pastor father. Yeah, I was terrified of him. But yeah, yeah. Was he rough even as a pastor physically? Yeah, I mean, he got his tattoos. We had like Jesus smoking weed in his arm. He has like <laughs> tattoo on his hands. You know, he's like, yeah. he, listen, I don't. You can look in a person's eyes, and you can tell, you can feel it, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're a kid and somebody comes up to you and is like, "That's your father." Yeah. I knew him. He like bit a dude's nose off and like beat him with an ax hand. I'm like, what? Like, I'm like six, like with like a Spider-Man lunchbox. Like, and of course my dad was like, you know, don't live that way. But the only thing I thought was, that's, that's how I so do. cool. Yeah. <laughs> did you, uh, did you have just a sister or did you have more? Sisters? Just a sister. Yeah. yeah. What was your mom like growing up? My mom is the complete antithesis of my dad. Yeah. She was like, Mrs. Like, and yeah. shoe shoe and like, you know, um, but she grew up, my grandfather was a World War II vet, um, and he served in Korea um, as well uh, in the Navy and uh, went on to GM and, you know, became a big time executive with them. It was like a VP of all their overseas sales. And, um, but she, she grew up in total opposite. My they had, they owned these bars and my grandmother was a big drinker and partier and they had seven brothers and sisters too. So they lived like upper middle class affluent, but chaotic. Um, and so my dad and mom have been together since 15 and 16. Wow. Uh -huh. Did you play sports growing up? Nope. Just fought a lot? I boxed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was a big boxer. Uh, so I grew up outside of Catskill, New York. Mike Tyson. Fact, uh, same Michael gym Edwards. I learned to box. Oh, shit. Same gym Mike learned in. That's wild, man. Mm -hmm. um, my claim to fame is I was a sparring partner for a period of time for Ray Mercer. Really? Yeah. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. uh, growth spurt-wise, like, were you... did. Were you a, a big kid growing up, or, or was it like one of those from freshman to sophomore year? I kind of had, like, foot? tits up until I was, like, <laughs> probably, like, until I was, like, maybe, like, tw I was always outside in the woods, and I was into hunting and fishing. I grew up, you know, there were 600 people in my town, so I grew up very rural. Um, I was into, you know, riding my bike and those kind of things. Sports were not a big thing. I played basketball, um, not really officially, um, but I... Uh, I was just, I was into boxing. Yeah. Like I've been pretty much boxing the most of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In junior high and high school, like was there a growth spurt where you shot up or were yeah. you always kind of a big kid? I grew, I, I like probably when I was like 14, I started getting really big. Yeah. It sprouted a little bit of a mustache or everything. And then I started, uh, you know, uh, I worked, uh, I started working at 10 years old on a dairy farm. Oh, really? And then, uh, and then I became, started working for a family that owned a line company. And that's how I became a telephone pole lineman, climber. Sure. Yeah, yep. that's cool. Yep. Did, uh, did the growth spurt impact your boxing style significantly? Uh, huh. Yeah, I think it like slowed me down, to be honest with you. Um, and I just was on and off, you know, with boxing. I wish I had been more consistent, but I, uh, to be honest with you, like my, you know, initially my family, like in the early years was very poor. Like we lived all lived in the same bedroom uh, of an old house. Like, and, and so, you know, I couldn't play football because my mom, they didn't have money to, uh, for the gas yeah. to drive me. And so that's really why I didn't get to do those things. Boxing is like a sport where you show up, like in the old school boxing gyms, like in Casco, if you show up and you're willing to like get in there, you're, it's free. No shit. 
Yeah, like you're not paying like a membership. You know, you go to places like Philly, you go to places like Baltimore, places, you know, where guys like Bernard Hopkins are from or Gervonta Dave, whoever these guys. They, it's a thing where you're not in there paying like a $395 membership, you know, and getting all this gear and all this stuff. You go in there and you got to be able to fight. Do you think Davis is going to beat Garcia this weekend? I think that's an interesting matchup, to be honest with you. Like, stylistically, you know, Gervonta Davis fights, like, with a Philly shell style. And uh, um, uh, Ryan Garcia fights really open. And, you know, they say, oh, he only, you know, he only has one punch, all this kind of stuff. I think, uh, but if he hits you with that, it's, yeah. it's really, he has a weird way of throwing it. And so I think, like, Gervonta Davis is smart enough to stay away from it. But to be honest with you, I think I think Davis is the better boxer. Yeah. So if he can box him and not get into a, a throwing match where they're winging punches, which sometimes that happens because of you know ego or whatever, and you're trying to show your toughness and all this kind of stuff, and you get caught with it. It's the punches yeah. that you don't see that knock yeah. you out. I think uh, very similarly to Floyd, um, and I think he'll do that same thing, exactly what you're talking about. He, he's smart enough to know how to – take you into deep water and fucking drown you, you know? But yeah. It's boxing is like, I look at MMA guys and you know, I always laugh because it's like, dude, like MMA, like they like, <laughs> there's no like standing eight count or whatever. You get tapped out. It's kind of boxing. The guy is like, you know, his eyes are crossed. He's on roller skates and like, you good. He's like, yeah, <laughs> I'm great. Like I'm perfect. Yeah. yeah. It, w- it would be cool if, uh, if in MMA, they would kind of, Especially with the TKO stuff, like, yeah, you know, maybe give, give them a, a second chance. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe. I think so, because I think like, you know, uh, those kind of you know, punching each other out like that, like you can, you can recover from that and get up, especially with training and your neck muscles, your jaw muscles and all the things. And I think it's like kind of a disservice when they call it too yeah. soon. For sure. When they call it too soon, I guess in, in thinking of it, I do like the, the absoluteness of. Like if you get finished, you're getting fucking finished and you don't get another chance, you know? So I I think there is, there's a purity in that, that, you know, boxing coming from the roots that it did, it was more of the gentleman thing. And it's like, okay, I knocked you down. I'm going to give you a chance to get up. Whereas MMA is a little more brutish and and savage like, which I can appreciate, I guess. But yeah, but, uh, any rate, I don't not to get too far off, but uh, what, what was the, the trigger mechanism with which you decided, holy fuck, I want to join the Navy and become a SEAL. Like, when did that happen? Yeah, well, I had been, uh, so basically, you know, kind of rolled out at 16, and I was on my own. Um, on, and, on purpose or by choice? Yeah, by choice. I just kind of organized religion for me and all those kind of things, and it was a strict rule, uh, you know, the kind of the way I lived. And, um, you know, by the time I was 15 years old, I was basically I'd already kind of become my own man. Um, I had spent, you know, summers working in New York City on a line crew. I was a... Uh, kind of already going down the wrong path, I guess you could say, you know, the wrong path. I don't even know what that path is, but it was the wrong one apparently. <laughs> and I went down it. Um, and, um, and so I lived on my own. Uh, you know, there was a point uh, where I was uh, homeless. Uh, um, not for long, but I was, uh, it was rough. You know, I was like knocking off street people, and, like robbing them for food. Like I was stealing my food. I mean, it was rough. I was in trouble. and Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take a quick minute to talk about our sponsor, Manscaped. Uh, spring has sprung, and our good friends at Manscaped uh, have the best tools for some spring cleaning. Uh, they've already helped us tidy up the nooks and crannies of your body's basement, but this year Manscaped can help you get the perfect presentation on that beautiful face with the new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Uh, make sure you look your best this spring by using the code mic drop to get 20% off plus free shipping at manscape.com. That is mic drop is the code for 20% off and free shipping. Um, in terms of taming your mane, I will say as, as a, uh, possessor of beards, um, you know, this product is a, a phenomenal product for a number of reasons. Number one, the quality, uh, it's very, very well built and you, you get that impression the second that it's in your hand. Uh, the battery seems to last forever on it, which uh, for me is convenient because I travel a fair bit and it's nice to be able to take it and not have to worry about bringing the charger and all that shit. Um, it's got 20 different hair cutting lengths, which, uh, you know, for those of you with the big Fu Manchu or, um, you know, the uh, Mike Beltran referee style uh, uh, beard, you know, you, you have uh, a lot of different options. Uh, in terms of the quality of materials, 
There's titanium coated T blades. Uh, it's tough on hair, but it's it is really smooth on your face. I mean, you can still trim uh, your undercarriage even with the beard uh, beard dev- uh, beard hedger and and uh, still not have any problems, which I can certainly appreciate. Uh, the kit also comes with some liquid goods. It's got uh, beard shampoo and conditioner, uh, which if you don't want to look like the Unabomber and you just rolled out of bed with shit spraying uh, every which which direction, uh, that shampoo and conditioner uh, can certainly hook you uh, hook you right up. Uh, the beard oil also uh, does a good job at uh, giving you that silky smooth finish that uh, all the ladies love and dudes sometimes, let's be honest. Uh, and the beard balm is a, a kind of a pomade style if you want to get really crazy with it, uh, which, uh, you know, certainly plenty of uh, plenty of folks do. So uh, it's got uh, eucalyptus, rosemary, lavender essential oils uh, infused into it. Uh, makes you smell uh, exactly how you want to smell when uh, when you're grooming up your beard. So um, the Beard Hedger uh, Pro Beard Kit also comes with three gifts, which is a brush, a comb, and scissors to ensure that your beard is ready to impress. So uh, again, I want to I want to say that uh, Manscaped's been great to us. I use their product uh, most days, and uh, it's you know been been a very very good staple uh, part of my routine for uh, for all my grooming needs, and that's top to bottom. So twenty uh, percent off code Mike Drop which is 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Again, that code is Mike Drop, all one word. Thank you much. Were you in touch with your parents at that point at all? No, so, I, I didn't talk to them for years. Really? Yeah. So was was there a, a catalyst that you're just like, all right, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Fuck this, I'm out of here and left? Yeah, I mean, I'd gotten into uh, my buddy. I'd gotten into some like real legit trouble. Um, it was like a really, I guess you could say it was probably like a really bad day. Um, uh, <laughs> going to the details, but it was a bad day. I, I'd love to hear the details. I think, <laughs> I think the, the listeners would love to hear Listen, the details. It's a, With that fucking shit eating grin. I yeah. don't even think I've ever even like, I rarely tell that story, but it was just, it was like kind of, I had moved out. I was like living in the hood with a bunch of my friends and all of them were troublemakers. I was working in New York city at the time. Uh, I dropped out of school, um, you know, doing all the things, selling drugs, getting fights like constantly, like, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I ended up the morning started where I'd walked out of this apartment and there was this kid that gave me like this guy who's a punk, like, it, you know, gave me this like nasty look or whatever. And I got into the car and the whole day started like that. And, and he pulls up behind me at a traffic light. It was like the dead of winter back in New York. And, uh, <laughs> He kind of looked, he had a system going, you know, back when people used to bump the system. And um, he uh, kind of gave me, he gave me like the finger or whatever. And I got out of the car and I walked back and he got out and uh, I picked up a piece of ice off the ground and I whacked it over top of his head and like beat him right up at the traffic light. Pretty good. Got back in the car and like went to the mall. So I go to the mall like with my friends and uh, my buddy at the time had like, basically stole a bunch of like had a bunch of stolen vcrs and back when there was vcrs and they were worth money like my buddy had stolen and had him in the back of this car um and we got in a high speed chase with the cops later on that evening um i jumped out of the car and ran away and my buddy took off and totaled the car was on the news he went into the windshield he was a tough guy busted the window out got away he's 16 you know, we're like teenagers and I go back to the apartment we were living at. Well, luckily I just got changed, got showered up. I, I mean, they were like looking for me, dogs, everything, the whole deal. I'd never been so cold in my life. I get back to the house, I get out of the shower, I sit down on the couch and it's like, boom, boom, boom. All the cops are there. And I just like, they trace the VCRs back to the address to the whole thing. And I mean, I didn't know about the VCRs me in the trunk or whatever. So I just played stupid and they're like, Hey kid, don't you leave this house. I'm like, you got it, sir. And they had like a squad car out there. Well, of course I climbed up on the roof, right? <laughs> Took off and, uh, ended up, uh, you know, that's when I left, I split and I knew some guys that were, uh, um, my, it was on the news. I met linked up with my buddy, got with my friend, you know, and told him, paid him some money to take us down to Miami to these guys that I'd met who had been traveling around the country selling mescaline. I didn't even know him. I had nowhere to go. I was terrified because now we're wanted by the cops. And so, um, yeah, I didn't come home for five years. Jesus. Yeah. And so when I did get home, 
uh, I got, uh, um, I was home for like a couple days and I saw my parents for the first time. Like, I think I saw them once over those years. And, um, did you have warrants out for you? Oh yeah. yeah. They got me right there. Oh, okay. So, uh, they busted in my parents' house, take me down, whatever the whole thing. My uncle's an attorney at the time. And I had like kind of turned my life. Oh, well, I was trying to turn my life around at this point. And, uh, so I go back to line work. <clears throat> I start doing that. And, um, did you go to prison or jail? Jail. Yeah. But it, but at this point, everybody had pled out that was in trouble. And two of my friends had did time nobody snitched on anybody everyone kept their mouth shut my one buddy did two years the guy that crashed the car so uh, i think you know whatever i served uh 45 days and um i uh um got in a fight in there caught another charge uh, with a guy this is in new york like county jail yeah yeah in upstate or like upstate new york city new york. okay yeah, and so uh so here I am, like, thinking, like, my life is, like, over, dude. And, like, so I'm in there, and I get in a fight with this dude over Jerry Springer. Freaking, he, <laughs> there was a toothbrush. There was a toothbrush for turning the channel, okay? And he was, like, on the phone rapping to some girl. And I walk over and change. He's like, yo, I'm watching that. I'm like, Pff. I mean, before I could even finish my, Pff, this dude <laughs> pounded me, all right? Like, threw me. And I was inside of, I was inside of a trash can. He hit me so hard. Like, a prison trash can is not good. And, and I got up and I walked in the back and there was this guy that came up to me and like my nose was bleeding and I'm, everyone's yelling. And, uh, he's like, Hey brother, he's like, you can't let that happen. I was like, man, I kind of feel like we're outnumbered in here. <laughs> and he's like, I got you brother. So I was like, no, I'll never forget. I took like a big swallow and I walked up there right in front of everybody. There's probably 40 or 50 dudes. And I would just set a bunch of things uh really intense i'm like you're gonna come over here i said you're gonna like kneel down and apologize to me i said i was terrified to be honest this guy was huge and he came over and took a swing at me and i just so happened to kind of slip it and i and i hit him with like an overhand and he tripped actually and bonked his head on the bed the steel bed frame and when he did, like blood in his head opened up and I climbed on top of him. I don't remember the rest, but I remember getting beat by the prison guards like pretty bad. Then they put me like into real prison. I was like an annex building. So uh, I'm in there. Uh, before the charge came up, I get out. I'm like really lost, to be honest with you. I was like lost in my life. And you're and, like 20? Yeah. And uh, I was miserable. And I turned 21. And uh, I started doing line work and I, I ended up uh, buying a truck and getting back into that business. And uh, I started playing drums again in the ska band that uh, some guys I had known and they were touring. And I was kind of really starting to make a lot of money and I was kind of getting on the good path. I'd moved back. And then um, I was on a telephone pole on September 11th in Queens, New York, when the first plane hit the World Trade Center. Wow. I was about 60 feet up on a railroad pole, actually, is what they call them. I was putting in power supply. And, um, did you see it? I just the smoke. Okay. Um, and I came down and you know, that, that tower had fallen. I was there. I was in, I was when tower seven collapsed, I was probably 150 yards from it. Holy fuck. I had found a dead police officer at that point, um, that had gotten buried underneath his car. And, um, you know, I went in there, I went from Queens into the city cause I thought America was like under attack. I didn't, you know, I mean, what am I going to do? Like run around and like, I don't know, play the drums on people's heads or something like but that was the kind of person I was. And I went there and I remember um, after climbing inside the World Trade Center all night, um, I'll never forget it. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the most profound memories of my whole life, uh, sitting there the next morning on the East River and I was crying and I was with the kid, guy I grew up with my whole life. And I had had all these experiences and all these things. And I used to be embarrassed to talk about these things like back in the day because I cared what people judged me or whatever or thought about me. I don't give a fuck. So I'm like, I sat there and here I was. I was like, my buddy looked at me and he goes, what are we going to do? And I remember it was September 11th and I was sitting there and I was crying. I was crying for so many reasons. And I said, I'm going to fucking kill whoever did this. And my buddy looks at me and he's like, um <laughs> what we're gonna be okay dude like he was a total skater like frosted tips you know 
And uh, so I went down, I like, uh, I keep working, you know, I keep doing line work, whatever. The contracts get canceled because of 9-11, all this stuff. The war starts kicking off. And uh, I decide I'm going to go down and join the army. <clears throat> um, and uh, they wanted to put, you know, I want to be a ranger, all these other things. And literally I'd gone there so many times and the army was, there's so many people joining the military at the time. And uh, the Navy guy was like, not really filling up. <laughs> And he was kind of fat and like baldish and like the guy that got me. And uh, I ended up going with this other recruiter. Funny enough, apparently the recruiter like listened to like the podcast or something. I was like, well, I'm not fat and bald. I'm like, I know, but the initial <laughs> dude that was there was fat and bald. And he was like carrying a junk food bag um, of like McDonald's or something. And he's like, hey, I keep seeing you here, dude. And he shows me like a CJ Caracas video or something like yeah. uh, dudes in flutter kicks and doing all the shit. And I was like, I'd never heard of the Navy SEALs. Like I didn't know what they were. And I just looked and I was like, heavy metal music, like dudes like blowing shit. I was just like, these are the baddest dudes on the planet. Like, I want to be a part of it. So I bought into it. And then they're like, uh, you have a felony, like <laughs> you have a felony assault charge that was never processed. Like you have to get like a waiver and this and that. Like, and so I wrote a letter to the judge. Uh um, and, and I said, like, I've turned my life around and all these kind of things. And like, I was there at the World Trade Center and like my nation has been attacked and I want to do something. And like, I'm not that person anymore. And, and the judge gave me a Noel Prasi, which means like not enough evidence to convict. It was for a fight that I had gotten into with this like 40 year old dude. And I mean, I really beat that dude up. Um, this is not the guy in prison, this is a separate guy. No, it's a separate guy and he, um, I'll never forget it. I mean, I was like 17 years old and the guy like, he was this like construction work guys like BMW. And I remember he like, he looked at me, he's like, you little punk bitch. He called me. And I remember I like turned around like for no reason. And I turned around and looked at the guy and he just looked at me. He's like, it's little pieces of shit like you in the war. He says to me, and before he could finish his words, pretty much every piece of hate I had in my life, I took out on that guy in the hood of his car, his grill face like i mean i was like went crazy well i skipped bail is what happened was i got picked up like six months later uh for having an underage container and he had gotten run over by a bus and killed oh shit yeah and um this so, is after the fact yeah this was after the fact so what happened was they knew i was like guilty but like there was nothing to prosecute so the judge wrote a thing and gave me uh, something so I could go into the military. So I provided to my recruiter, I got the waiver uh, and I joined the military. Uh, and it, obviously I'm sitting here today, like it changed my life. That judge wrote that letter and, um, you know, I don't have one regret in my life, nothing, zero. Had, had you uh, swam much before you joined the Navy? No. So no, I started figuring all this kind of out later because I'm, a, I know, I'm, a, I'm a curious person. I'm self-educated, you know, I, I read. And so I started getting these like Navy SEAL books from the library. Like uh, matter of fact, Kirby Harrell was like my first master chief. He was in uh, the book Hunters and Shooters Vietnam Master Chief. <laughs> and I had like, or I was like, oh my God. Um, and I really like learned about the legacy. And this is the harmful thing for me is that I'm like loyalty is my game loyalty is my game and uh you know, that's why i roll with a, a smaller circle of people in my life loyalty is my game and i think it's a gift when you have a loyal tribe a real loyal tribe and uh you know that's what i like really gravitated towards about the seal teams you know what i later came to find out is like half you know so many guys especially today now are just attacking each other and they hate each other and i'm like if it was like it was back in the day I believe like the SEAL teams could be like leading this nation. <laughs> I yeah. mean, to be totally honest with you, like they could be providing solutions, insight, uh, but uh, unfortunately it's divided and it's conquered. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, that's what initially drew me to it was this brotherhood. And so I read every single book I think that was ever written about the SEAL teams uh, before I went in. And let me tell you something, I figured out how to swim. Yeah, uh, And it was... <laughs> Like I figured it out and, uh, it was cool. It was, uh, it was, uh, it changed my entire life. Like everything, you know, I mean, I started reading about the constitution. I started learning about my country in a different way. And, um, it was a, uh, 
yeah, it's like something to this day. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm not a career guy or anything like that. I, you know, was in active duty and then went into the reserves and like, uh, primarily because I was like disenfranchised, uh, kind of with like not getting to fight enough essentially is what it really was. Um, because, you know, I felt like this was our nation's time to rise back then people loved America. Yeah. You know, I, I think people forget, like, we were united. You could go in the grass station and everybody was together. And unfortunately, it takes crisis for us to, like, lean on each other. Um, and, you know, I wish I wish we could get back to that. I don't, I don't know if it's possible. It could be. I wish we could get back to that sans crisis, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but I agree, like, that having a united enemy is about the only thing that will keep this country together, unfortunately. And, and right now, it's like we're our own fucking enemy. Like we yeah. hate, we hate each other more than we hate any, anything else, you know, and it's, it's fucking sad. But, uh, so from nine 11 until you went in, how long of a period was that? Uh, 2003. Yeah. So okay. I, uh, from nine 11, I think, uh, so I was in class two, five, four. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I, I was like, I think May, 2003, I went in 2000, 2003, I graduated buds in 2006. That's wild. So, I mean, I was an instructor when, when you were there then. So I had, yeah. So I had, um, were you at 254? I was, but um, so I, I kind of floated between indoc and first phase, depending on what was going on. Because uh, I, I got yeah. valley fever, which is why I ended up there. So I lost like 40% of my lung capacity and fucked me all up. And so they sent me to Bud's. And so like the first year and a half I was there, it was like. Rick Smithers. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like I would be, um, you know, with the brown shirt fucking rollbacks for a while, and then yeah. I'd, I'd jump in with an indoc class, and then I'd work part of first phase. Like I just kind of floated in the first phase indoc, um, you know, I guess uh, entity for you know the first half of the time that I was there while I was trying to heal up and shit. But um, anyway, yeah, I mean, I think like uh, it was interesting because I really felt very ill-equipped you know, at the time, but actually life had equipped me. I always said that I felt like really ill-equipped because I didn't take the traditional route. Um, you know, I, you know, I didn't play sport. I wasn't like a popular, I didn't play sports. I wasn't like, you know, the head of the team or Sally from the prom or like any of those kind of things. I just kind of always like blazed my own trail, uh, not saying what I did was right all the time. Well, but I think the, the key to, being successful in whether it's a SEAL teams or, or any special operations force, like the, the, I think the most important thing is being able to fucking figure things out. Mm -hmm. You know, really it, it's like being handed a shit sandwich and figuring out a way around it. Like that, that's the, the most important aspect, you know, and growing up the way you did obviously prepared you better than probably anything could have. Yeah. Uh, you know, a hundred percent. It's like, I, I feel like so many times, like we get into uh into shame, like thinking about the past, you know, or like, you know, people think like, you know, or they try to hide who they were or whatever. And, you know, I always use this example, like there's not one thing that I would change in my life. Yeah, There's just not, because that's an irrational thought. Like you wouldn't, you would have to hate who you are in this particular moment, right? Like, uh, and absolutely despise your every aspect of your life would to be to change one thing. And I think like I've really come to terms that the past can never and will never ever be altered. And to be able to reach back into the past, kind of like the story I just shared, um, which I've never really shared um, to be truthful because I used to be like kind of embarrassed, right? Where I'm like, oh, I was like kind of a thug and all these kind of things. But you know what? That's just the truth. And the truth is like whatever has happened and whatever is happening now, but when you can reach into the past and remember all your experiences, but without the emotional charge, then you can gain wisdom. And wisdom is what we're missing. We're taught like, oh, the past, we want to alter it, or this shouldn't have happened, or this happened to me, and I'm the victim of this. Like, I mean, it's, it's a waste of your life because then the future conditions from doing that get created, create more of the very thing that you don't want by, you know, wishing and hoping that, you know, this stuff didn't happen or going back and constantly regurgitating it. And it's like, you know, I tell people, I'm like, listen, if something happens to you and you become a, um, let's say you get in a car accident, right? And you're pissed off about it and you're kind of a broody person. So you brood about it 
and it kind of becomes a habit for like six, eight weeks. Then the next year, you're still doing it. Well, that becomes like a straight up habit. And then it turns into a personality trait. And then you become the archetype of that energy. And now you're known as a negative person, right? Or you're known as an angry person. I'm an angry guy. You even have names for yourself, you know, the angry frog man, you know, the pissed off dude or whatever. And you become the thing. Um, you know, that's why I'm like, I tell guys, I'm like, the past is our, it's, it's a wealth of knowledge. And if you can't get any of that knowledge, you will be powerless in your life. None. Like I reach back and I realize, like, ultimately I was creating the conditions through my childhood and my life that I needed to learn about who I was as a person. I really did. You know, because I was already a man when I went into, you know, when I went into buds and all the things, like I was a man. I, 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 I wasn't like afraid or anything like that. It was interesting. I was judging myself because I saw all these guys that like had a lot better physical tools than me. You know, like, you know, they had done the route and played for Texas A&M and done all these things and stuff like that. I'm like, what am I? What am I? But deep down inside, I knew I had been tested in life in situations that would break most people. Self-induced, <laughs> self-induced, but like, but now I can reach back. And then when you are honest and vulnerable, like I just was, honest and vulnerable, you give permission to people to do the same thing. And what we need as a society is we need the truth. And the truth sets us free. If everybody just stopped right now, right fucking now, just stop what you're doing and reach up into the invisible space, the fourth dimension, and began to stand and pull those things that you keep hidden down and speak your truth, the conditions of your life would change immediately. That's the nuclear weapon, is the truth. That's why everybody suppresses it or they put so much shit out there that you can't figure out what the truth is and that's why you have to learn how to trust yourself but we're taught to be afraid of our own selves and so we power we, we cover ourselves and all this shit you know thinking that it's going to prevent us from the inevitable which is we're all going to die everyone will die everyone listening to this podcast will die but how you live on this earth is how you'll die because you have to learn how to do it. And in the learning how to die, you set yourself free from the things that you're doing to try to prevent yourself from the fear of the thing that's inevitable. So to me, it brings up an interesting um, thought in my, uh, I guess, recollection of everything that you've gone over thus far as it relates to you know, your childhood equaling what you've become, right? And, and agreed, like not having regrets is crucial. But I'm also curious um, if you look at your childhood and, and what it made you, right? And then you contrast that with the childhood that you're providing for your kids. Is there an element of kind of eustress and, and purposeful struggle that you weave into your kids' lives so that they have a, a healthy understanding in a similar fashion? Like, do you do you design a certain level of hardship for them for that? Because I think... You know, it, it, it's a it's a fine line to walk of you know being a, a good parent where mm. like you can you can do too much and the you know road to hell is paved with good intentions. How, how do you navigate that, and, and what do you do to try to replicate uh, some of those things? Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest things, like same thing I see with the vets, is essentially that we we help people to death, and we help them so much that they um, with good intentions that they never learn how to help themselves, right? So I don't need to create those conditions for my children because those conditions are the essence of life. I just don't pad them, right? So my daughter, my kids, I told them straight up, I'll never pay, I'm never buying you a car. No one's ever bought me a car. I bought everything and I've worked for everything I have ever had in my life. Every single thing. I, I've done it. Um, I've worked every shit job you could ever even dream up in your mind. Um, all the, you know, all the things. 
So, and I told him, I'll never buy you a car. And, and I'll drive you to work, right? Because you'll never learn the value of what that car is if you haven't invested any time into it, right? I don't, uh, I don't shield them from the truth. I don't shield them from the truth. The world is what it is, not my perception, just what is. And remember, people say, well, what is truth? Everyone's always like, the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. What the fuck is the truth? The universe, the sky, the, I don't know, the UFO. Like, what's the truth, right? The truth is simply this. Whatever has happened and whatever is happening now is the truth. To lie to them and to not tell them the truth is to do a disservice. You tell your kids that Santa is going to bring you gifts through the chimney. You're a fucking fool because that's a lie. The idea that somebody comes because you behave a certain way is going to give you free stuff. If you act in a certain way, you get free stuff. That is a lie. It's not true. People may say, oh, the magic. Okay. That's not what magic is. People say, well, then what's magic? Magic is vision plus action. You have to have the vision and then you have to act. And so I teach my kids to act on the vision that they create. I don't shield them. When I make a mistake, I sit down with my kids. I tell them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I've done this. I've been on, I've done this. I've done that. Like I own it. I, and I give them the permission to do the same. And how I move through my own life sets the example for what they're going to face. Because let me tell you, the conditions that we're creating right now for our children, if they don't have the tools that I'm talking about in the future, you can pencil it out. When you see the dissolving of, of, of gender, of social economic, of race, political structure, Okay? technology, and environmental catastrophes. If you were to pencil it out in, an, in a mathematical equation, it's a reverse explosion, and it's happening right now. And remember, like, it's the law. You know, I teach my kids about natural law, law of cause and effect. That's a law that children have to learn, the law of cause and effect. Well, for every cause, there's an effect. And you're either the cause or you're the effect of it. Well, everyone's running around and they don't know it. They're the effect. They're the byproduct of the causers. And so when they learn, really, that the crowning jewel of it all is my actions. I have to get up and I have to act. I don't care how many cold plunge videos you watch and how many you know, breath work things you do staring at the wall or whatever the thing is. Not knocking anything, I kind of can come across sarcastic, but I'm not. Um, you have to get up and you got to do it. You have to do. You have to live in a different way. You have to change. You have to put the fork down. You got to get off the shit. You have to change. Like, otherwise, it doesn't matter. The incessant desire for information and to find out what's going on just creates more things to go on. So it's like teaching these laws to our kids and teaching them just like you think about societies like Native American societies, egalitarian cultures. What did they do? The young men were raised up to be warriors, right? They were raised up to be brave, what does it mean to be brave? People think, oh, like, you know, it used to be like a tough guy or whatever. I wasn't brave. I was scared. I was scared of not being seen on this earth, of being lost in the sea of people, right? I was afraid. The hero, to, the hero and the coward feel the same thing. The hero and the coward feel the same exact thing. The difference is the hero acts. He stands up and is like, doesn't mean he's not feeling it and doesn't mean he doesn't feel afraid, but he doesn't let it control him. And so like to teach our children, you, they have to learn the lessons that life has to teach them and you cannot shield them from that. 
people are like, I don't want to screw up my kids. They're already in a screwed up world. Like it's already, <laughs> they're born into it. Give them the tools, sit down. I sit down and I talk to the kids and I tell them the truth. And I teach them not to be afraid. What's afraid mean? What does it mean to have fear? Fear is nothing more than the same word for the unknown. Everything is selling you this idea that somebody has some secret sauce to prevent you from the unknown. You know, you see these boxers, they get up there $25 million. This guy's trying to take food off my family's plate. The fuck? What are you eating? <laughs> well, golden eagle eggs? Like, what is happening? Right? You sit there, you can't even focus. You're on your cell phone. You can't even pay attention. Like, the truth is coming at you. It's pounding you in the face, and you're rejecting it. Right? Under the illusion that you sell your power away to these institutions, financial security, not real. Financial security is fake. Marcus Aurelius, why? It can be taken from you in an instant. Physical security. Oh, okay, I'll like jiu-jitsu, karate chop you, like I'll do some, like the nunch. Guess what? You zig, they zag, you're gone. Care what you know, okay? You're on the border in Ukraine right now. You're zig, you zag, it's over, okay? Physical security. What are all of the things? The only thing you will ever own in this life and the most important and most valuable thing we give away, prostitute, and that's our choices. Our choices are so powerful that they terraform the planet. But if you can't think... And realize that your thoughts are creating the conditions you're experiencing. You're making choices that enrich and empower other people that build the prisons around you. You're providing the bricks. You're providing the ammo for the gun that's sticking in your own forehead. You're loading it. So it's like to sit down and say, hey, look at the, you know, the Constitution. Take that. It's the right document. Hey. People should be able to do whatever they want as long as it doesn't infringe on another person to do the same. America went to war over a 2% tax over tea. Over tea. Do you even drink tea anymore? I, even like, I mean, is that even like, I should be the first veteran tea company. <laughs> Murder, the oblong blend. Um, so, you know, like we have to sit down and get really honest with our kids. And then we have to set the example by how we live because your words, yeah, words are powerful. Sure, you feel them. But how we act changes the conditions and they see. And part of that is getting radically honest where we are right now in this moment as a species, kind of at the end of the developmental processes of what it means to be a genetic human being. Because I'm telling you right now, whether it's tomorrow or 25 years from now, or we're 80, this whole thing is going to implode yeah. on itself because of why the choices that we're making in the present moment. What, uh, in, in terms of kind of the big picture of how you view setting that example, what does that look like? You know, for somebody saying, Hey, that sounds fucking great. How do I do that? What, uh, what, do you, what do you tell them? And, and are those concepts or principles that you teach and, and go over in the program? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I'm more about getting people to think because I, I'm not going to be there. I can't think for people, you know. Um, but all the things I'm sharing, guys, like and subscribe. I'm going to go online. It's six ninety nine <laughs> a month. I'm going to give you all the secret truths to cure you. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's become, right? What I'm talking about is like it starts with micro changes, right? Like, how am I showing up in the present moment? I've been kind of saying this the whole time, but like, you got to remember the future is a concept. And people, if anybody wants to argue with me with that, here's what we'll do. I'll get a giant pot. I'll put your whole family in it with a giant burner with a handle underneath it. And I'll say, tell me what tomorrow is going to be. Write it down. Okay. Okay, if that doesn't happen, then I'm going to pull this lever. Okay? So the guy says, deal wakes up in the morning slips on his sock falls down the stairs and break his leg <laughs> future is a concept okay it's a concept it's created by who we are in the present moment 
So you have to stop and evaluate your life right now. If you're waking up and the first thing you do when you wake up is check your cell phone, you're wrong. You have to spend time with yourself. You have to get your mind, your body, and your spirit in alignment. In alignment with what? Truth. You're out of alignment. People don't know what that means. Look it up. Alignment. So you start with tiny little things. Okay, everybody's running around right now buying all this stuff, doing all these things. They're eating, you know, I don't know, like Norwegian oats and shit. And they're like, they're, they're doing all of these things right now, right? And they're missing the greatest metaphor, which is know thyself. Know thyself, not know your identity or know what experiences you've been through, but know yourself. So what are some things we can do? Well, the first thing that we teach in the program is radical honesty. It doesn't mean like run around telling everybody the entire truth, but radical honesty. See, it's a whisper. What happens is you really know, but what happens is you're scared of what may happen if you stand in truth. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what expectations am I tied to, right? What expectations, what outcomes? It lives in fear. It's why, it's why in Nazi Germany, they, they whisked the neighbors away and put them in camps and nobody said anything. And everybody kind of was, why? They were scared of what other people thought. What might happen? You know, the conditions that were created. So it starts with a practice with spending time with yourself. And you begin to learn to listen. And listen and silence are the same word, just jumbled up. Same letters. Listen and silence. And then you begin to hear. And when that knowing or that intuition comes to you, you have to act. And if you don't act because you don't have courage, you need to figure out why. Well, the reason why is because what are people going to think about me? Well, if you're ruled by the opinions of others, you have to change. You have to change, right? If you're ruled by the perception of what people may think about you or the fear of losing your you know, job and you won't be able to go to your office prison anymore, right? You have to be willing to stand in those truths. And it starts as just a tiny little baby step, spending time with yourself, figuring out what that is. Maybe it's sitting in quiet. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's changing the things. Maybe it's no longer taking hot showers. Maybe it's a screen time. Or maybe you get home at five o'clock. You never turn the cell phone on until seven o'clock the next morning. It doesn't matter why I'm going to be engaged with the most important thing in my life, my family and myself. Okay. Maybe it's living in a different way. Maybe it's looking at your kitchen cabinet and saying, golly, like we have four blenders. We have four blenders. We have six couches. We have five TVs. Maybe we don't take too much. These are all just suggestions. But like it all starts with radical honesty because deep down inside, I know that the power of the good mind is inside of every human being's heart. But we don't listen and we ignore it. And we're getting the byproduct of what we see from not listening is what's called ignorance. We ignore what's there. And that's when you sin against yourself. And sure, some people have airplanes and some people have this and some people have that. But at the end of the day, you're here for a reason. So we didn't just arrive here, okay? That's a nice little trick when you're like in your 20s and you think, oh, we're just, we're just a blob because it gives you an excuse to go to the bar and like get as many chicks as you want because nothing matters. We're all just plasma, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's a real reason here. And we're here during this epoch, an epoch, a time. We are in an age. This is an age and we're in an epoch. Seek out knowledge because if you don't have any knowledge, I'm not talking about knowing stuff talking about knowledge. If you don't have any knowledge, you have no power. You're powerless. And so, you know, for me, begin with these guys by removing all of the comforts that trap you. Incessant cell phone use, porn, you know, movie porn, fame, this, likes, all the things, all the things you become addicted to. Get rid of those things first, right? If you have, I don't know, more than 18 pairs of shoes, you have a problem. You're taking too much from who? 
our mother, a life-giving force that we're going to hand back, live in a different way, right? So those are just simple things that you can begin to do standing in truth. You know the truth, the truth will set you free from what yourself, I keep saying that, from you. So finding those spaces, pushing it away, not taking too much, standing in truth and learning about courage. And then once you get there, you start to teach other people to do the same and you grow and the thought revolution begins because your thoughts are creating conditions and we can create new conditions right now in this moment. The future can be different if we're willing to change. I, I, uh, I love everything you're saying. Um, in terms of the, the program, that first, you said it's two weeks of kind of a detox of. Yeah. So there's no, in the program, like, you know, if you want to like, you know, I tell people like, you, like <laughs> the program is that's a digital detox. So the program is there's no dairy, there's no cheese, there's no sugar, there's no honey, there's no bread, no noodles, nothing. It's meat and vegetables, water and black coffee just until noon. You shouldn't incessantly consume caffeine. It's not good. Uh, I take it from chief hypocrite. I know he's drink like two pots a day, like first thing in the morning, like terrible. Um, and then we remove all hot water. Why do I need hot water? Human beings never had hot water. It's modernism. And it also teaches you, it breaks the resistance. So the very, if you, I had to pick one thing to tell people to do, whenever something comes up that you need to do and you feel resistance, I don't want to do that. You have to do it. Okay. That's the simplest practice. For instance, things will pop in my head. I'm like, oh, I'm going to like, I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm like, go for a run or whatever. And I wake up and there's like eight inches of snow on the ground. And I'm like, I have to do it. Why? Because if you don't, you lie to yourself. And then you get comfortable lying to yourself. It's like, guys, for instance, like porn addiction is insane in the world. It's insane. Okay. So you sit there like, oh, I'm not going to like look at porn. Okay. And then you do it. And then you tell yourself, oh, I'm taking a whole week off, not doing it. But then you do it. What happens is, is that you can, you literally have no power. Your, the, the material self rules you in every aspect because it doesn't believe you. Oh, I'm not going to eat junk food this week. It's Timmy's birthday on Wednesday. Ah, uh, by the way, who cares, <laughs> right? It's Timmy's birthday on Wednesday. Timmy gives a shit. Yeah, I'll tell well, you, that. you know what, Timmy, <laughs> Timmy. Timmy, you got a huge ego. <laughs> so, like, it's Timmy's birthday, and you say, "Oh, I'll have a piece of cake." Well, guess what you did? You lied to yourself, and then guess what happens? The next time you make a commitment to yourself, the self doesn't really believe you. Ah, I'm going to go to the gym on Monday. Oh, Susie wasn't feeling good last night. You lied. So then you live a life of lies. And then you let other people lie to you because they always tell you, ah, don't worry about it, bud. There's always another week, right? And you, you have no more juice. You have no more juice left. So you got to start leaning into all resistance because everything is like the death we see happening is a death by ease. No more happier. You know, more happier if you had a hundred million dollars or you have five hundred dollars. Okay, and you're living paycheck to paycheck. You you're experiencing the same thing. You're experiencing the same exact thing. So we think like the freedom is like more stuff, more acquisition, more things, and it's wrong. The freedom is found by knowing yourself, which sets you free from the desire to have those things. I'm not saying don't have things and don't get stuff. That, that's okay. But like, it's not going to change the inside world because the inside world is creating the outside world. You're experiencing yourself. That's what it is. So lean into the resistance and begin to stand in your truth. And if you can't stand into the truth, you have to find the reason why there's you're tied to an outcome so much or an expectation or a social norm that now it's paralyzing you from living and doing what you're supposed to be doing. All dark sides of ourselves are created from our failure to accept social norms or being tied to expectations. I know 
I do it sometimes. I'm like, I should say something. But then I think, what if this guy like never talks to me again? And I think he's going to help a bunch of vets. And that's not truthful. What am I tied to? I'm more concerned about the future projection of what an individual may or may not do that I don't stand in truth. When, when you say I should say something, uh, an example would be what? Like, say, for instance, um, um, let's say you have a girlfriend. We'll use this analogy, right? Uh, everyone can relate to. Well, I don't know. Yeah, basically everybody can relate to, relate to it nowadays age. So let's say you have a, you have a girlfriend, right? And she's, uh, um, he or she, okay, is, uh, I don't know, 300 pounds. And you sit there and, and you're like, hey, um, you sit down, you tell them I'm, I'm no longer attracted to you and I want you to really make some life changes or this isn't going to be the direction of my life, right? And you do it in a very loving and a kind way. Which doesn't exist if you're uh, talking to, to a significant other about their weight, right? Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> so what, 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 what may happen, I'm just using that, this is a very superficial example. But what may happen is that person may never say something to the individual because they're afraid of hurting their feelings or offending them, or maybe they're going to break up and leave them and they got a bunch of cars, or maybe they even have a kid together. And so they don't do it. And so then they go behind their back and they live in misery and they bitch and complain all the time. And they never give the per person the permission to change. Everything, the most important thing that I've like shared in this entire podcast will be that the highest state that we can achieve in this life is unconditional love. It's love without condition. Loving every single person without condition. That takes only the true warrior can do that. How do you, uh, I guess, reconcile the, uh, I'm not attracted to you because you're 300 fucking pounds versus the unconditional love? Well, listen, this, it's how you present the truth, right? Because there's a dark truth. The truth is you could walk up and say, you're a freaking meat balloon. I still love you, but I'm not attracted to you. Right. But it's how you do it. Because what you do is you give them the permission to rise. You're not attached to an outcome. Let's say, for instance, like you're in a relationship and you're not, uh, um, you're not sexually satisfied. That would destroy a girl, right, if you were with her. But to sit there in radical honesty out of love and sit there and say, we have to elevate our relationship. We have to make changes. We have to begin to grow together. And these are some things that, you know, um, that I'm really feeling that are very real and I want to share with you. Now, two things could happen. One, she could grab a frying pan. Well, actually, numerous outcomes. <laughs> she could grab a frying pan and crack you over the head. Um, two, she could, um, I don't know, get a lawyer 20 minutes later and, and divorce you and take all your belongings and dissolve the business partnership. Um, or three, she could sit there and cry and look at you and say, thank you. And I'm going to change. I'm going to rise. And we're going to do this together. And next thing you know, it's the most ex beautiful experience that you've ever had because you've given the permission to be vulnerable for that person to grow. Well, you can't really do that until you've done it with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself first and you have to learn how to do that. It doesn't mean that I always do it and I've got to figure it out. I want, I want to be the first to say, like, I'm not saying I have the answers or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't want to come across that in any way. But what I'm saying is that this is what we're being called to do as a species right now. Do you remember the last time you lied to yourself? Yeah, just recently. Um, I um, sold my wife's car. Uh, and bought this like old suburban so that I could like liquidate our money to buy some equipment for the ranch. And uh, I searched all around the state and I was moving super quick and I found a company in Missouri. Uh, I get in touch with them and go back and forth and negotiate and check all the business licenses, change where commerce, all the things. Basically transfer my life savings for this heavy equipment. Uh, and the company that was a real company had been hijacked by some uh, offshore uh, hacker group. And um, I lost everything that I had. And um, 
<laughs> like when it happened, uh, the guy called me on Easter and everything was being shipped. And they, I mean, they were great. I told him five kids. It was like, I mean, this is everything we had. But here's the thing. I was going to go to Missouri and I was going to pick it up. Now, of course, I've done all the admin things, the FBI or whatever. But it's gone. Money's gone. And uh, uh, what had happened was I, want, I was getting a good deal and all this stuff. And I had done the due diligence. They had hijacked an existing company. So it was an actual company. I just was like, there was a middleman that had kind of got me. Like a ransomware kind of thing? Or? Right. But it was actually, it's a group. They've, okay. they've, they've extorted uh, millions and millions of dollars from people doing this. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> uh, and they're great. You're talking to your family, you get to know them, all the things. And you know, like, I'm, I mean, it's a huge purchase for us, right? Skid steer, a little backhoe. Anyway, sell my wife's car, all the things, but it's like suburban, 15 grand, because we're like, we're simplifying everything. I don't want any, any new cars. I don't need anything except for motorcycles. I don't need anything new. Like, we're just, we're living in a different way, right? And so what happened was the guy called me back and said, hey, I talked to the boss. We're going to do free shipping. When he said that to me, I got an electrical shock that hit me. And I felt weird about it and my wife's like I don't know like I have a weird feeling about that like it's just weird it's there's something and I started feeling it so I went online of course to verify instead of trusting myself I went online and I verified all the stuff chamber of commerce secretary of state business filings but I knew but I wanted the good deal we have all these projects. I built this like 66 foot by 17 foot geothermal greenhouse. I sold my like pride and joy 75 forward. We're living in a different way, right? Literally really doing it. Uh, food, water, and shelter first. My buddy RC Cardi talked about with, on the podcast, food, water, and shelter, community, your tribe. That's it. How are we living? How are we showing up in the world? Well, I knew it, but I override it with information. And I lie to myself. I go against myself. The very thing that I talk about all the time, I did. And it cost me all the money. Okay. Well, I'm not upset in any way. I accept it. Because to be upset, even in that moment, when I knew I'd been robbed for a substantial amount of everything I had saved, okay, I... I knew that the past couldn't be altered. And so I accepted it. And I said, what's the lesson in this? And the lesson came to me, you know, uh, a couple nights ago when I left on the trip, you know, my wife was like, or I was here when it happened, actually. I was, uh, my trip had just started uh, when we knew. And uh, I, uh, I really realized that that's a very cheap lesson to learn, that no matter what the external circumstances are, that I have to trust that voice no matter what. So if, if something, I'm not saying like, you know, every like fat girlfriend or boyfriend go tell them like, you know, like they suck at sex or anything. Okay. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that if it comes to you and you feel it, you need courage. You need the heart of a warrior that leads with his heart. You need that heart of a warrior to stand up and not be afraid of the outcomes of the expert. And I was tied to an outcome. I wanted to get all these projects done. It was a really good deal. I, you know, I thought I could do this and had an attachment and I could maybe sell this. I had all these other things rather than listening to myself. So ultimately, I knew I was being robbed but I used my mind to reinforce my own correctness that I wasn't. And so that's called sinning against yourself, right? Well, that's what I did. So like that was very recent. So I had to own it and I just had, I had to own it. I, I talked to FBI guys like, I'm like, I'm not upset. Like I'm, I'm not upset because I did it. I knew he's like, what? I was like, I knew I had an intuition and I ignored it. So did my wife even stronger than me. Uh, but I went online, I verified it. Everyone, trust but verify, right? KGB actually said that, not Ronald Reagan. He copied it. Um, but uh, 
Um, so that was a lesson where I lied to myself. I lied to myself because I was more tied to an outcome that didn't exist in the future. Like I talk about the future is a concept. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It is. And I violated my own thing that I always say, I even use this analogy. You're in the boardroom. Everyone's meeting together. It's high pressure. The deal's going down. Jim, we just need your signature. And you reach for the pen and someone's like, this is not good. I shouldn't do this. But everyone's staring at you and you're like, come on, Jim. Champagne's ready. Jim. And you're like, oh, fuck it. And you sign it, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, company's over. Bombed. And you're like, I knew it. Sure you did, Jim. You always say that after the fact, right? Yeah. Okay, because we have to trust that voice. That's my point of all of this. You have to trust it. And if you can't, you need courage. You need to get some courage. And maybe that starts by getting up in the morning and having some courage to stand in a cold shower for two minutes because that's something that you can physically do, okay? Because you're that decrepit and weak. And it's okay. I've been weak like that too. But that, I mean, that's a simple thing where you're like, you have to start at baby steps. What you're learning to do is the first crawling of what it means to be a human. What does it mean to be a human? That's what I'm talking about. It means to participate in creativity. Life is your curriculum. Life is the curriculum. And your creativity is the one that moves through that curriculum and, and then you fulfill a purpose and then you learn how to die and then you're free from all the things that you were afraid of and it doesn't matter. That, that's what we're being asked to do right now in this time and maybe there's one person, maybe there's two people. I have a tribe of people that are living in a different way. True people and when you go to war out of love, you can't fucking stop anyone like that because there's nothing to take you can't take my life if i'm not afraid of losing it you walk in the woods and there's a bear there's nothing to take you can't kill me it won't kill you daniel in the lion's den the lions won't kill you why he's not afraid of dying there's nothing to take zero so it's like okay if there's nothing to be taken from you, then you can stand in the truth. Because what prevents you from standing in the truth is the fear that what something would be taken from you. But when you absorb the fear from the unknown, this is when the revolution starts. The thought revolution. People start saying, no fucking thank you. Canceling the Netflix. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm living in a different way tiny little steps instead of one donut instead of seven donuts this morning i'm eating one maybe that's where you're at okay get the one without the frosting here we go <laughs> the, the no frosting donut step one <laughs> that's fucking classic i had all kinds of concrete in my neck and like was pretty tore up and i got into the shower and there was like just blood pouring off of me, just little pieces of meat.